So on behalf of the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, good evening and welcome to ELSA's first webinar on COVID-19. My name is Elizabeth Moore. I'm joining you from my quarantine cell, also known as my office in Iowa City, Iowa. Uh, and assisting me this evening to share in the moderating duties is Velia, uh, who is with us from Parma, Italy. I sincerely appreciate her heroic efforts um, as she is assisting me just coming off shift in the middle of the night. Uh, so thank you, Velia, uh, who I see has her video off because um, I'm sure her attire post uh, isolation is, is just wonderful. So with that, we'll get rolling for tonight. So I do want to start off by saying, you know, I, I recently had a conversation uh, with a wise colleague and a friend of mine amidst a bit of a meltdown yesterday. And he reminded me that with great power, that power being knowledge that we all possess comes great responsibility. Many of us have assembled here tonight because that sense of responsibility to our patients, to our colleagues, and perhaps even our family is bearing down on us. In the face of auctionator shortages and PPE requirements that seem to be changing by the minute, we are being asked to make tough decisions regarding who we can offer ECMO support to and understanding so that we're being asked to do so when we realize that resources are scarce. The beauty and the intention of the webinar this evening is to remind everyone that you are not shouldering this responsibility alone. We have assembled the true embodiment of the ELSO community as speakers tonight, an international group of dedicated healthcare professionals ready to help you navigate these challenging patients. About a week ago, we began fielding questions via social media and an email in preparation for the webinar. The speakers have seen the questions and have incorporated the responses into their presentations. As well, we hope to field questions for those of you joining us live. You'll be able to submit your questions through the webinar and we will do our best to get them answered uh, tonight. So with that, I would like to get started off with our first speaker. Dr. Matei is coming to us from the University of California in San Francisco. He's a professor of medicine and anesthesia, a critical care specialist, and serves at UCSF Associate Director of Critical Care Medicine. His NIH-funded research focuses on finding new ways to treat acute respiratory failure in critically ill patients, particularly those with sepsis. Tonight, he's going to open up our webinar by speaking about ARDS management with a special reference to COVID-19. So with that, I will let you start sharing. And thank you so much. And we will pass it off to our first speaker. see it. And can everyone, is that uh, clearly visible, Elizabeth? Yep, you just put it in presentation mode. Perfect. Okay, so it looks good. Looks so good. my part, all right, thank you. So my part of the uh, discussion is focused uh, as an introduction to ARDS with special reference to COVID-19 as uh, Elizabeth uh, nicely introduced. Um, this slide is from the Philadelphia Inquirer from March 17th. It says, when coronavirus kills, the lung condition ARDS can be the culprit. Here's what you need to know. And of course, this shows the ICU setting. And uh, we know how hard our colleagues in Italy, China, South Korea, France, and parts of the United States are working. Uh, this is a major, major undertaking, this picture, uh, this photo captures so much. ARDS, what is it? I think um, everyone in the field knows it's a form of non-cardiogenic protein-rich pulmonary edema. This chest radiograph shows bilateral pulmonary infiltrates and the histology uh, panel on the right shows pink protein-rich pulmonary edema in the alveoli. The, uh, Definition is by the Berlin criteria with a PF less than 300 millimeters of mercury in conjunction with these bilateral infiltrates. There are approximately 200,000 cases per year in the United States alone before COVID-19. 
Mortality is 20 to 45%, depending on the initial degree of hypoxemia. And the associated clinical disorders are pneumonia, sepsis, aspiration, and trauma. But pneumonia has always been the most common. And now we have another outbreak of severe viral pneumonia as the leading cause, COVID-19. This slide is intended to just give a brief overview of the pathogenesis of ARDS or acute lung injury. This is based on both experimental and clinical studies. It's important to realize that the primary mechanism is an increase in capillary vascular permeability in the lung, even when the problem is pneumonia. The protein-rich edema escapes from the plasma into the interstitium and then into the alveoli where you can see the pink protein-rich edema fluid. And there's injury at the same time in severe cases to the epithelium. Neutrophils, platelets, and extracellular traps contribute to this injury. And probably in COVID-19, quite a bit of monocyte activation and there's a role for lymphocytes. Importantly, there is direct entry from pathogens in their products. This is particularly relevant, relevant for viral pneumonias. And non-pulmonary organ failure and comorbidities contribute to the higher mortality. Next slide just summarizes in one, one, one slide that we have learned a great deal about the mechanisms of injury. It's uh, illustrated in this slide, um, and we've learned so much about how the epithelium and the endothelium are injured. There's impaired ability to reabsorb alveolar edema fluid. There's epithelial cell death, and there are a variety of pro-inflammatory factors that contribute to this process. We have also learned a lot about the repair process, which is remarkable, beginning with reestablishing the epithelial barrier and the, and the endothelial barrier as well. Now, what are the clinical features of ARDS and COVID-19? As we know today, we're gonna to discuss this more. My colleagues will go into this issue, but some patients present with a pneumonia that does not require ICU care, but may worsen in the second week of hospital care. ICU care in about 20 to 30% of hospitalized patients, but this will vary around the world. ARDS in about 17 to 29% of hospitalized patients and mortality maybe is approximately four to 15% in ARDS patients with a markedly higher mortality with older age, especially over 70. The next three slides will show chest radiographic and CT findings in COVID-19. This first one shows in the left lower lobe a patch of pneumonia with the black arrows indicating a localized pneumonia, which can be seen also on the CT scan. So this patient is presenting with just a small um, area of pneumonia. The next slide shows a patient who has developed bilateral infiltrates that you can see faintly, but definitely on the CT scan, as well as the chest radiograph. This too is COVID-19. Next slide shows bilateral ground glass opacifications in COVID-19 that leads to ARDS and respiratory failure. What about the lung pathology in COVID-19? Well, we have some information. Uh, <clears throat> there is, as shown in panel A, upper left, alveolar edema, upper right, uh, protein exudates. Uh, panel C shows fibrin debris along with mononuclear cells that include lymphocytes. And panel D shows hyperplastic type two alveolar epithelial cells and the arrow points to a possible viral inclusion. Now, although the focus of this uh, webinar is quite a bit on ECMO, I just wanna emphasize that in the phase of respiratory failure before the patient absolutely needs intubation, uh, <clears throat> treatment with high flow nasal oxygen can be supportive. It may delay intubation and may even prevent it. Uh, this is a, a reference to the classic uh, article in the New England Journal in 2015 by the French group that showed in patients with progressive pneumonia, high flow nasal oxygen uh, made a big difference in their care and was associated with a higher survival than just standard oxygen care or non-invasive ventilation. Next slide focuses on respiratory treatment of COVID-19 uh, ARDS. First and foremost, low tidal volume, four to six mLs per kilogram with a plateau airway pressure less than 30. 
this is the first and foremost um, goal of supportive care. Positive index respiratory pressure should be at a moderate levels, trying to maintain plateau airway pressure less than 30. Neuromuscular blockade should be considered in patients with significant ventilator dyssynchrony, high airway pressures, and worsening hypoxemia. And finally, prone positioning, if the PAF, PAO2, FIO2 is less than 100 to 150 millimeters of mercury, usually administered or provided in the presence of neuromuscular blockade. Now the next slide just illustrates, I think, something important. It shows the big difference in mortality that was the result of our low tidal volume trial published 20 years ago. But I wanna point out on the far right here that that trial and that therapy was associated with reduction in IL-6, IL-8, TNFR1, and SBD, an epithelial marker, showing that this treatment really affected favorably the biology of ARDS. The next slide illustrates this, in which on the upper panel, you see the effect of high stretch ventilation, which exacerbates the endothelial and epithelial injury, whereas the lower panel shows that the endothelial injury and the epithelial injury are less and provides a, an environment in which a repair can occur with lower levels of the um, pro-inflammatory markers and there are also fewer inflammatory cells. The next slide shows the results of the PRONE trial, the classic study done in France, which showed that PRONE positioning in patients with moderate to severe ARDS, PF less than 150, increased survival. And that's very important to remember. Next slide uh, reviews briefly adjunctive treatments for COVID-19 ARDS that can be considered. Inhaled nitric oxide in the range of five to 20 parts per million can be used for refractory hypoxemia. Fluid balance. We are recommending moderate fluid resuscitation for intravascular fluid repletion, but only moderate. Third, a conservative fluid strategy shown by the ARDS network in 2006 can benefit the patients, reduce the pulmonary edema, and allow them to be extubated earlier. So targeting 0.5 to 1 liters negative fluid balance daily is reasonable. Dialysis with continuous venovenous filtration, if available, can be provided for oliguric renal failure, pH less than 7.2, and to achieve negative fluid balance. And then ECMO, if all else fails and the, and the patient qualifies by EOLIA criteria, is certainly reasonable to consider for COVID-19 ARDS, particularly in patients with primary respiratory failure and uh, largely excluding patients with multi-organ failure in very advanced age. Uh, finally, possible other treatments for COVID-19 ARDS based on our experience with the H1N1 outbreak and ARDS in that setting and uh, several studies, glucocorticoids are overall not recommended. There is interest in experimental therapies, including anti-IL-6 or IL-6 receptor blocker therapy, interleukin-1 receptor antagonists and interferon beta, but they all have concerns, particularly related to how they might worsen host defense. Um, we have a program for treating uh, patients with moderate to severe ARDS with allogeneic mesenchymal stromal cells. This is an attractive option and phase because <clears throat> of prior work we have done, and we're currently conducting a phase 2B trial for ARDS with the good preclinical evidence for mechanism of benefit. We don't know if it will be effective, but uh, it's an ongoing trial in which we will enroll COVID-19 patients. Finally, high-dose vitamin C, a very important phase two trial published in JAMA a few months ago, showed an impressive decrease in mortality and favorable other findings. It's not clear for sure that high-dose vitamin C will be beneficial, but it's a potential treatment that may be helpful for patients with ARDS, uh, that we don't know if it would be for COVID-19 ARDS, though the side effects in these uh, patients were absolutely minimal. And we're beginning a phase two trial in 
the NIH pedal network uh, next month. And uh, I think that's the end of my slides. Uh, and so I will, uh, I need to go to stop sharing. Perfect. Let's yep. see. So we'll have you stop sharing and I'll be passing over now to Dr. Shikar. You should be able to get on now and start sharing your screen. Let me see. Uh, I want to stop sharing. Uh, yep. Wait, let's just Perfect. See. Oh, okay. So, you came up. Uh, yep. So we should be able to, perfect. So Dr. Shikara is a senior intensive care specialist in the adult intensive care services. He's the deputy director of critical care research group at Prince Charles Hospital in Brisbane, Queensland. He contributes to the scientific committee of the International ECMO Network and the education committee of APLSO. He also leads educational research working group of the Global ELSO Education Task Force. His presentation tonight is going to focus on the use of ECMO in COVID positive patients, their organizational aspects, patient selection, dealing with the surge, uh, and a wide array of topics here. So without further ado, I will hand it over for you to start, Dr. Shikar. Uh, thanks, Liz, and uh, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, I hope you're all okay. Uh, these are quite unprecedented times and we got lots of unknowns. My thoughts are all with our friends who are working very hard day in, day out in various parts of the world. We are actually here to discuss what role ECMO, ECMO may have uh, and how we can provide ECMO while also providing uh, quite a high quality intensive care to a large number of patients. Uh, to be honest, I don't have all the answers to the questions. We have lots of questions. I'll try and reflect on some of these things based on what data is available and uh, some of the views could be my own and I don't represent any organizational views. Having said that, uh, let's get started. All right, so the, some of the key discussion points for today are, you know, in this height of a pandemic, can we provide ECMO? Should we provide ECMO? If, if we should, who should receive ECMO? And how to organize the ECMO services? So let's look at, are we able to provide ECMO? So the ability, of, uh, ability to provide ECMO during a pandemic uh, obviously is largely determined by uh, the capacity uh, we have in intensive care. And we're dealing with a very interesting virus which is highly transmissible. At the same time also, uh, showing significant severity of illness, uh, especially in the vulnerable population. So it's, it's, a, it's a highly transmissible vi virus with a great degree of severity of illness in those uh, infected. And it's spreading rapidly as we know, and um, the epicenters moved from uh, Wuhan and surrounding areas to Italy, and they're going through a tough time. And it's going to go many places. And as we can see, um, this is a very rapidly changing scenario and a large number of people are getting infected worldwide. We estimate that up to 60% of the population may be infected. Uh, 15 to 20% uh, who test positive will need hospitalization. 5 to 10% or even more uh, may need uh, ICU admission. And clearly at peace times, uh, at best of time, so critical critical care resources are always finite, and we none of the countries have a huge capacity to to cater to the such heightened need. Uh, as some of the prediction and modeling has showed, of uh, our colleagues, the Imperial College did some fantastic predictions uh, based on the numbers, which are very self obvious there. Uh, as the age uh, of the infected population goes up, there is significant mortality, morbidity attached, and uh, the numbers we're looking at are quite uh, daunting, and actually it could be further worse. And as we can see on this slide, you know, we are trying our best in every country to flatten the curve and, and mitigate uh, the surges that can happen in the intensive care units. But despite the best efforts we can see there, the modeling shows that we will still be overwhelmed. And that's 
we saw that in China where up to 5% of the patients um, admitted to ICU. In Italy, they say up to 12% of the patients who tested positive uh, are trying to uh, get into ICU. And these patients spend one to two weeks typically in the intensive care unit. So we can imagine the burden. And there's some modeling from Italy where they looked at linear and exponential models of um, um, possible surge. And listening to Professor Pesenti this morning on the ESICM uh, webinar, we found out that they're somewhere in the middle. Uh, thankfully, they haven't gone fully exponential, but they're still having to care for a large number of critically ill patients. Uh, what do we actually want is our aim is to uh, have a critical care bed for everyone who think who will need it and who will benefit from it. Uh, this may not always be possible. And because we are talking more about ECMO uh, in this webinar, we need to keep in mind, at least based on the ELSO registry data, uh, these are the registered centers and, and the number of centers that can uh, provide ECMO. And we know it's a very finite resource. And in the end, I think whether we can provide ECMO in, in such a pandemic depends on a variety of things, including public health measures, which will continue to flatten the curve, allow us to provide the best of care to a large number of patients. And this is easier said than done, but it will all come down to that. And to summarize that point there, if the curve is flatter, then the resource intensive therapy such as ECMO can be considered. Should we provide ECMO? Uh, once again, as I said, when you're in a state of surge, uh, it may be challenging. And we need to realize that is a, there is a quite a, a lack of um, understanding this. There is a significant difference between COVID-19 and H1N1. Our H1N1 experience may not fully guide us in this. Uh, and do we really have the resources for ECMO? And do we really uh, go into a panic mode and increase ECMO capacity around the world? Uh, if you look back uh, at our H1N1 experience, uh, we did see the use of VB ECMO, which was quite stable with 20 to 30 runs per year based on the ELSO registry, shot up by around 600 cases in the 2009-2010 the period. And subsequently, uh, the use of ECMO has consistently gone up, VB ECMO, I mean. Uh, but we were catering to a relatively smaller number of people around that time, and our ICUs were not in such a state of surge. Uh, and also, thankfully, many of those uh, registry uh, documented cases were also published. And actually, we did reasonably well. Uh, obviously, uh, pool mortality was 37%, but that's not the full story. There were some small case series where mortality was as high as 68%. Um, and H1N1 was a quite a different disease too, you know, compared to even seasonal flu. Uh, a lot of the infected patients were younger than 65 years of age and largely single organ failure. And there was a dramatic age shift compared to seasonal flu in that season. Uh, whereas uh, based on the data we are seeing, uh, COVID-19 deaths are happening in older patients increasingly with comorbidities and uh, there are more multi-organ issues. Uh, and clearly with, with that population as it stands, it's not a usual practice to use ECMO in a, in a, in a, in a liberal fashion. Uh, so what should we provide? Of course, we should provide high quality conventional ICU care on a large scale. At least we should try to. And equally, compassionate value-based care is equally important in, in times like this. Uh, and we need to also remember that from whatever we have seen in literature so far, published literature, talking to our friends, to date, the outcomes haven't been great. And a lot of them also need additional mechanical circulatory support. You can only imagine the complexities of changing configurations day in, day out, uh, initiating circulatory support, uh, and further need for LV unloading, et cetera, uh, in those challenging times will not be easy. However, this patient population so far, our experience suggests the outcomes haven't been great. Uh, so what we need is that, of course, we should provide ECMO, 
uh, in highly selected patients. But what we don't need is a lot of ECMO. We need, whenever we do it, we need to do good ECMO like we usually do. Uh, we need to look at who should receive ECMO. And that's, you know, obviously determined by patient characteristics. PE1 best of times used in carefully selected patients. Uh, should we use the usual selection criteria for COVID-19 patients? I think from what we know so far, that's a reasonable thing to do. And uh, we don't know enough about the patients and their pathophysiology and data is just starting to come out. And I'll just quickly take you through some of the papers that's been published and what we understand about the population. Uh, this is the population uh, that was described in the Lancet of 191 patients. This, this, this probably has shown the worst mortality possible in all the other case reports. Um, the patients who develop ARDS, pretty much all of them died, 93% mortality. Patients who had additional heart failure were uh, also quite vulnerable. Patients who developed septic shock and then they, they had 100% mortality and that's quite an extreme population compared to some of the other papers. Uh, there was this uh, more relevant paper to VV ECMO field. There was a patient population of 200 uh, who developed ARDS, severe ARDS, and they described a 52% mortality. Uh, and roughly it's estimated that around 20 to 30 percent of these patients develop ARDS. Uh, and then there are several such smaller or case reports. Uh, some are 100 to 200 patients. I'm not going to describe each one of those. One is as recent as uh, 21 patient case series that only came out last night, I think, in the JAMA. So they're all good reads that will help us understand the type of patients we're dealing with. And Interestingly, um, th this letter intensive care medicine showed that the predominant uh, for presenting problem to intensive care is respiratory failure. Often these patients have significant concomitant heart failure and then some have isolated severe heart failure more than respiratory failure. But if you put cardiorespiratory combined, that's almost 86% of the presentations. But listening to Professor Pesendi again this morning, the, the kind of patient population they see in Italy is, is slightly different. So uh, we, this may happen everywhere. We may see different types of uh, uh, patient populations depending on their underlying age and comorbidities. And mechanism of organ injury is also uh, quite unclear because whatever limited autopsy data is available suggests that uh, the novel coronavirus 2 is behaving quite similar to coronavirus 1 uh, with significant virus associated injuries or infiltrates seen in liver, lungs, heart. But what that means and how much is that causing primary injury, we don't know. We need to keep in mind this is the population often uh, with significant underlying cardiovascular comorbidities and other comorbidities. So uh, the mechanism of multi-organ failure in this population itself is quite interesting. And that may explain why, despite ECMO support, some patients still progress to multi-organ failure, but we don't know enough. So summarizing that literature, what we know is we still don't know much, uh, but to get some guidance, we can say increasing age comorbidities, patients who are quite hyperinflammatory, that is with a high interleukin-6 or a high D-dimer, uh, they tend to do not that well. Uh, as always, if you have extra pulmonary organ failures, um, your chance of you know, getting away even with ECMO may not be that good. And interestingly, in, in multiple series that's been reported, patients are leukopenic, which is quite an interesting observation in itself, and they tend not to do well. And I think we need more data, and uh, there is a, a large multi-center study uh, globally happening. You can see the site maps there. More than 120 sites are participating. We're really looking forward to robust data to come out of Italy, as well as data through this large study so that we can get some more guidance. We hope that once we get that guidance, we can then generate some ECMO scores for COVID arts, uh, but it's not gonna be straightforward. There will be ethical dilemmas. Uh, risk prediction models are not perfect. 
Uh, I think for me, the bigger issue is not who should get ECMO. I think looking at what's happening uh, in Italy in the state of surge, who should get mechanical ventilation, it becomes an even more basic question. So who should receive ECMO? A small number of highly selected patients. I think in times like this, if you are in doubt about patient selection, if it's a marginal patient, I think it's better not to put them on ECMO. Uh, and how to organize ECMO services? Based on, once again, what we've seen, the need for ECMO is quite small. Uh, having said that, in Italy, for those number of infected patients and nearly 1,500 ICU admissions, uh, from what I heard this morning in the webinar, there was only five patients who received ECMO so far. Up to 30% patients were proned. Uh, the similar situation in many other parts of the world, except for Japan and Korea, they have been using more ECMO than the rest of us. Uh, and kindly, they will be providing us with the experience soon in another webinar. We look forward to that. But the need is small. But it still be, will be challenging for us to provide it when our ICUs are flooded with patients needing mechanical ventilation. And I wouldn't dwell too much on this in the interest of time. Uh, we just published a paper on how to plan and provide ECMO if you're already an existing ECMO center. Uh, and uh, this paper will come out in the next 24 hours and provide some stepwise guidance. Uh, um, there is no doubt we should be prepared uh, and we should select carefully and provide the best of care, including best of ECMO care to some patients as, as resources allow. And in that paper, we do mention about a sort of a 10 point ECMO action plan. A uh, lot of it is something we all know, but it's all put in one place so that there is some guidance and we can thought, think through all the issues that might come up when planning ECMO service provision during a pandemic. Uh, I think this is the larger point I would like to make is that, uh, you know, ECMO is not something we would put on the front line when we're dealing with thousands of patients trying to get into intensive care. I think looking at what's happening globally and the way infections going everywhere and, and the every health system will be under stress. And I think we have to balance our roles. We, first of all, we need to, we are not only healthcare workers, we are also citizens of this world. We need to, we need to champion public health measures and, um, and try and spread the message and get the community to engage. Equally, we are healthcare workers. We hear about teams coming together, orthopedicians running an IV in the ward. So pretty much the hospital becomes a HDU. So everyone important, everyone's got a role to play. And then we are intensive care specialists or any other specialty holders. I think our subspecialty, which is ECMO, or any other subspecialty comes at the end because this pandemic is not a time to deliver advanced subspecialty care. I think we have a larger responsibility, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do ECMO. My personal view is that we should do it. We should do it in very carefully selected patients. And when we do it, we should do it very well. So that's all I would say. Uh, let's do what we normally do in ICU and aspire to do good intensive care, and most importantly, protect the staff. Thank you all for listening. Great, thank you so much, Kieran. So we will switch over to our final presenter. Great, it looks like. Dr. Ramnathan is a specialist in intensive care at the National University uh, Hospital in Singapore. He's a senior consultant in their cardiothoracic ICU and the director of the ICU fellowship program. Uh, he's gonna round off the presentations tonight speaking on staff protection, PPE during ECMO initiation, transfers and ongoing ECMO care. Um, and I will just remind everyone too that we'll be taking some uh, live questions, so please feel free to submit those and we'll uh, allow our panelists to be able to answer those in real time. Um, so without further ado, I will let you proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you in whichever part of the world you are in. Um, as Kiran alluded to, we are really going through tough times and uh, everyone uh, in the ICU is geared up for this pandemic in different ways. Um, I'm here to share some slides 
on some of the important infection control measures and some nitty gritty of ECMO management in these uh, COVID patients. Uh, <clears throat> I'll, be, I'll try to be as short as possible as, so that you know, we can invite more questions and see how uh, we can answer your queries, which are more important. So starting off with the basic question, uh, what would be the ideal PPE to be used when you're managing a confirmed or a suspected COVID-19 patient who is on ECMO? Well, um, at the outset, I got to tell you that there are guidelines which are currently available. So there is the WHO guidelines, the United States CDC has its recommendations, and ZIX also came up with its recommendations earlier this week. Um, the very fact that this question has popped up is essentially because there are subtle variations between these guidelines. And uh, of course, uh, when it comes to uh, the crux of the problem, it's essentially a question between where you follow droplet precautions and where you follow airborne precautions. Uh, one of the things these guidelines clearly highlight is the fact that when uh, you have aerosol generating procedures in the ICU, airborne precautions is a must. And the reason why we need to know about this is essentially uh, because uh, the, there is a difference in attire for droplet precautions and airborne precautions. Uh, WHO recommends droplet precautions for routine care. However, you know, uh, ANZIX on the other side has clearly said that all patients, all critically ill patients would need airborne precautions. So where do we reach a consensus on this? Well, I would think, you know, these guidelines are here to help. The best way to decide between what is best um, as well as protective as a healthcare worker between N95, PAPR or a standard mask would be to go through these guidelines sit down with your uh, local infection control authorities or your local health authorities, have a guideline, something like this. So at Singapore, this is being guided by the Ministry of Health, where patients uh, in the ICU um, would need full PPE, uh, not the patients, the uh, people taking care of these patients will need full PPE. Mind you, as long as you're going to be inside the negative pressure room, this is a must. Once you're out of the negative pressure room, if you're doing remote monitoring, a surgical mask should suffice. Um, so that, that would be the best consensus to deal with uh, this situation currently. Mind you, a lot of this will uh, again be dynamic. There will be shortages of these PPEs as we meet the surge. So at that point, things will have to be changed and that's where the CDC guideline has clearly mentioned that you, even uh, um, uh, an ordinary surgical mask would uh, suffice um, till your PPE stocks are uh, reinstituted. So going on to other uh, important aspects of infection control practices for the ECMO patients, I would think there are some essential components which you need to be aware of. So in addition to the infection control measures that you practice in ICU uh, for these highly infectious patients, um, the, the um, other important component of infection control here would be to make sure that all members of your ECMO team receive adequate training in using these PPEs. <clears throat> So um, it's not just donning and doffing of these PPEs that you need to be adept with. You need to be sure that after donning them, you are good at uh, performing procedures. So these are photos from our simulation uh, training that we did a month back. We had uh, the operators donning in all these PAPRs and uh, PPEs, trying cannulation, priming the circuit, uh, don't stop just with that. You will still have to practice hard on some of the ECMO emergencies, things like air embolism, pump failure, cardiac arrest. These are all things that do happen with patients on ECMO, and you need to be prepared for that, 
if you are going to offer ECMO in your center for a COVID patient. Um, some of the desirable components. Um, so when you have a surge or when you have more than one ECMO patient, it'll be good if uh, expert centers consider developing faculty level plans to group them together. Um, not just that, um, centers that retrieve patients uh, from uh, peripheral hospitals, it'll be good to harmonize these practices with the um, regional hospitals. Um, you have a standardized approach to these uh, PPD devices. <clears throat> uh, some of the other minor point, uh, mainly from a practical point of view, uh, from the ground, you got to understand that a lot of these patients would be uh, uh, treated and managed in negative pressure rooms. So communication with the people outside the room, even for a simple thing like an ABG syringe, can be very difficult. You need to be, uh, uh, you need to find out other ways to make sure that the team outside the negative pressure room clearly knows how it is to be done. So get used to signposts, whiteboards, sometimes walkie talkies also help. You can see how close they are, but they still need the walkie talkie to communicate. You also need to know that, you know, uh, uh, the operators or cannulators who are, who are cannulating, unless and until you're familiar with your goggles, you're familiar with your PAPR device, um, you can have issues uh, with vision clarity. A part of your vision will be impaired. So, you know, all these things need to be trained as part of preparing for the pandemic, even in the ECMO patient. How about the feasibility of remote monitoring uh, during the ECMO run? Um, you would find that after the initiation of ECMO, um, once the patient turns out to be more stable, uh, remote monitoring might be possible. When I say remote monitoring, the, you, you may not need a healthcare personnel by the bedside 24-7. Uh, they may be able to step out of the negative pressure rooms and monitor them from outside. Now, another scenario where remote monitoring is going to help is when you're going to have a surge and your ICU is flooded with ECMO patients. When I say flooded, you have many more ECMO patients to manage. Uh, you may end up doing remote monitoring, especially in the situation of um, uh, having uh, staff uh, restraints or constraints when uh, health healthcare workers also get infected. Uh, the other aspect which I thought I should touch upon is with regards to the transport of these patients. Um, mind you, you can have inter-hospital transport where expert centers uh, get or retrieve patients from peripheral centers. Make sure that expert centers have a clear cut eligibility criteria for these patients, like any other ECMO patient. You've got to understand that the rapidity of disease progression in COVID is, is quite fast. So you may want to define the moment you want the transfer to be done if you're not retrieving. Um, so uh, as part of our ECMO retrieval services here in Singapore, our decision initially was to transfer these patient to an ECMO center as soon as they are intubated. But of late, we've been seeing a surge and there are peripheral centers that are attempting proning. So as I said, these are decisions that might be dynamic, but it's always good to have them on board uh, when, when uh, you embark on inter-hospital transport. Now, if you're going to a peripheral center to uh, initiate ECMO, you should be aware of the local resources you need to have clear cut guidance with the peripheral center on how the patient should be prepared and uh, uh, so that you know your turnaround time there can be shortened. And you've got to identify rate limiting steps in this whole process. Now, in addition to inter-hospital transport, these patients will also need intra-hospital transport to the cat lab, CT scans, or the operating room. The most important bit about the decision-making side please consider the risk benefit profile. The possibility 
uh, the risk benefit, benefit profile, not just from a patient point of view, but also the possibility of disease dissemination to the healthcare workers and the public. So essentially, you know, you, you uh, follow strict infection control practices. So this was one of our patients who needed a CT scan. Uh, the CT scan was essentially planned at that point of the day when there would be less public around. So this was done at about seven in the evening. Uh, as soon as the uh, CT scan was planned, uh, we made sure that the entire route is cleared by the security. And we also have a housekeeping who immediately cleans up the route as well as the lift that uses these, I mean, where these patients go through. Um, at the CT scanner, as and when the CT scans are done, the patients get transported back to the ICU. Department of Radiology has its own standard operating procedure to disinfect the room as well as the scanner there. So these, are, these are subtle things, but this needs to be taken care of when you are uh, in an ECMO center. Your patients would need transport at some point for some investigation, at even, even though we would want to avoid it as much as possible. Last but not the least, uh, there was uh, uh, this was one of the questions that was raised. What's the evidence for viral road and risk of infection transmission through blood and other body fluids? Um, the fact is, it could be transmitted through almost all body fluids. The main uh, mode of transmission is respiratory. The oral root has been demonstrated. It also is transmitted through fomites. So that's where your hand hygiene plays an important role. So when you're sending investigations for your uh, ECMO COVID patients, make sure you take the necessary precautions. They should be double bagged, transported in a special box to the lab by hand. I'll stop here and I will wait for your questions. And if I can answer any of them, I'd be definitely be happy to. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we do have a few questions that came in here live. So um, if our panelists wouldn't mind just being on the ready here to answer. So the first one is, um, is there confirmation that a PMP oxygenator is a viral barrier? Is scavenging of, ex uh, of gas exhaust recommended? Anyone want to take that one? Uh Interesting question. I don't know, honestly. Um, to be that's the honest answer. Ram, do you have any ideas? So we do use HEPA filters on our transport uh, ventilators. Um, uh, most of the time, as and when the patient is connected to the ventilator uh, inside the uh, negative pressure room, uh, we use the same ventilator to transport outside uh, uh, for investigations. So yes, uh, the answer would be yes. I think the question, Ram, was um, whether the ECMO oxygenator filters soft. Ah, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I got it. Got it. Got it. Which I don't know yeah. how much viral load gets into the blood. I need to look up. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, yeah I, I don't have any data on it either. Sorry. Great. So next question is, could you elaborate on strategies for anticoagulation in view of hypercoagulable conditions of these patients? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll have a crack first. Look, this is a very interesting question. I think even going back to pathophysiology of disease and given the disproportionate hypoxia we see in the absence of severe dysfunction or pulmonary system compliance, uh, there is always a concern of whether there is more here and whether the patients, a lot of patients have been reported to be very pro-coagulant. So is there more mechanisms for hypoxia in the pulmonary bed itself is an interesting question. Uh, and then in the context of being hypercoagulable, whether these patients need extra anticoagulation, uh, that's once again, I'm not sure because often these patients have multi-system organ failure, liver dysfunction. So it's a, a combination of variety of factors and we haven't seen enough. And uh, maybe in the next webinar, our Japanese and Korean colleagues may give a lot more insights. Great. And then kind of the, the same question is, um, 
you know, what is the anticoagulation management for COVID-19 patients is the same as, is it the same as normal VV ECMO? Should be, we don't know. <laughs> Once again, <laughs> in the, yeah. Go ahead. Well, the question for me is, you know, you, you, when in peace time, we are happy to run and change the circuits if it clots. Even a circuit change in a crisis uh, is tricky when, when in these patients. Uh, so the tendency would be to anticoagulate, I guess, but then it's once again risk benefit. Um, once again, more data is needed, and that's where I think data collection is really going to help. Ram, any further thoughts on your part, anticoagulation management? Um, look, uh, uh We've not been, we've not changed any of our uh, anticoagulation protocols for COVID per se uh, uh, when it comes to ECMO. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, as Kiran said, you know, we need further data on this before we change our practice. So I would think, you know, sticking on to the current practice um, would hold good. Uh, and we would probably get to hear more from uh, our uh, colleagues in Japan next week how they did it. Great. Um, so a couple about uh, some of the selection criteria. So one being is the RESP score still a reasonable risk stratifying tool for patient selection? Um, and then piggybacking off that what someone asked, uh, any indications beyond EOLIA, best candidates if limited resources? Yeah. You want to go first, Ram? Oh, sorry, what was the question again, Liz? Uh, can you go so over that is again? The rest, is the rest score, score still a reasonable risk stratifying tool for patient selection? So I think just kind of some further clarification of, you know, is there any modifications that can or should, or do we know at this point, um, is there anything that is going to be a better scoring tool to determine um, if we need to modify our patient selection? Yep, probably. Uh, a bit too early to uh, uh, decide on that. Uh, um, again, you know, our, uh, our data on uh, the COVID patients are uh, currently mainly from China and Italy. And, uh, you know, to modify, uh, and we get to see that, you know, there's a big chunk of them getting critically ill. Uh, what percentage of them would benefit from ECMO in this context, whether you can stratify them uh, with the current score, uh, it's not something that that probably would be uh, evidence based if we were to change our strategy. I think you know sticking onto the RESP score for now would still be good enough. Um, yeah, Kiran. Well, the only comment I would make is uh, the RESP score, as we know, doesn't involve uh, a significant other organ dysfunction. And I would be very wary of uh, extra pulmonary organ failures in this population. I think Dr. Professor Fessen, once again, uh, in his wonderful webinar, told us this morning, this is a single organ disease in younger people, and it becomes a multi-organ disease in vulnerable populations, which are old and with comorbidities. So uh, I think if you are embarking in a high-risk group, uh, clearly, unless it's single organ failure, if there are other organ failures involved, I think we should be very wary. I think it should be a combination of RESP score, of course, and preserve scores, and and, and, and variety of things and other organ dysfunctions. Uh, it, and often these patients have significant cardiac failure. I think embarking on once again VA and VAV and other advanced ECLS strategies, once again, is quite complicated, may not be feasible or in the resources available, also may not lead to a good outcome anyway. So uh, yeah, it should be, I think, limited to single organ failure kind of scenarios uh, to rescue patients. Another question in, coming in, um, asking uh, if anyone has a handle at this point on the percentage of patients that are supported on VV versus VA ECMO, and any anecdotal thoughts or comments on that? Um, so the only data I have on is from Korea. Our colleagues from Korea shared their initial data. They had about 29 ECMOs, and they they, they they said they, they, it was 50-50, so 50% 50 of them were VA and 50% VB. Mm -hmm. Our first patient was a VA patient, so uh, and, and uh, we are moving on to VB um, in the next couple of days. Yeah. And 
we need to keep in mind the Korean population was quite an outlier. I think they had a predominant significant number of younger patients as well, based on what they've reported so far. And that's that's not similar to anywhere else in the world. So we'll wait to hear from them. <clears throat> so I know, Kieran, you, you somewhat spoke to the ethical pieces and, and sometimes the scarcity of resources. And one question um, that I've seen posed um, is, you know, how do we address the ethical issues of not offering ECMO support? So um, centers like mine here at the University of Iowa, um, you know, we are facing challenging times and a limited availability of resources, yet, you know, we have historically felt very comfortable within the right setting to be offering ECMO, yet, you know, we're reaching out to colleagues who are making those tough decisions to say, maybe we can't offer ECMO. Um, and a lot of discussions around age cutoffs, um, as we know with some of these uh, COVID cases that are becoming critically ill, uh, and maybe the 70 plus population, um, you know, how, how as an ECMO community and some of the discussions that are out there, you know, how do you navigate some of those ethical pieces of potentially not offering support in centers that, um, you know, typically would have offered? Well, look, I think we, it's stressful, it's not easy. I think we will have to make some tough decisions and already people are making them. This is going to be very difficult. I think none of us have faced anything like this in our intensive care or other clinical careers. Uh, it's going to be tough. But I think sticking to ECMO, as I said, the, the basic question will be who should get ventilated. I think if you're looking at a 50, 60 percent mortality uh, in, a, well, in a high risk population, because we're only talking about survival, you know, these people need to go in the community and thrive. They need to have a good long-term quality outcome so that the challenges don't stop just with survival. So we are really, can I guarantee when I have an elderly person in front of me with significant pre-morbid issues and who are really critically unwell, what can I guarantee them? Can I return them to reasonable quality of life, even with mechanical ventilation, let alone uh, more advanced therapies? And that that's the way we look at first and then I think with ECMO, we've always been selective. I don't think we ever indulge in ECMO in, in non-selected patients. We don't recommend that. And it's, it's a therapy that should be used at best of times in selected patients. And that, that has been shown in, you know, and also the earlier population was a good population. And the challenge will be to explain this to the community because they would naturally believe that we are withholding things in the context of increasing demand. And that conversation with community should begin, hopefully, even before they get into ICU, because they need to understand we are doing best possible practice, even in these times. And if we withhold certain treatment, that will still be, hopefully, based on best interest principles. But there will be times where quite a harsh triaging will happen. Uh, I hope I don't have to do it. Uh, but my, my full... Um, thoughts with those who are doing it already. I, I'm, I might add to that, I agree with Dr. Shekhar. I think this issue of when to ventilate a patient may be more critical, just like he has been saying. And that's why I included in my slides the emphasis on high flow nasal oxygen. If it's available, it will not be available everywhere, but it is um, probably a way to one, delay intubation or avoid it or provide that level of support to, um, to patient, all patients, but particularly those who are more fragile and have multi-organ failure. And that decision to ventilate um, itself, intubate and ventilate, needs to be thought about very carefully. It's not just a matter of rationing resources, it's making that good decision about whether it's likely to be in the patient's interest to be ventilated. That can be done sometimes with the patient himself or herself participating as well as the family. Thank you. Um, so I'm not sure, uh, so this question's just come in as well. So do you have experience with uh, out of house transports or you know, we could say transports in general of COVID patients? And if so, do you recommend going above the World Health Organization CDC guidelines in regards to PPE during these transports? 
uh, <coughs> so um, as much as these transports go, um, as I alluded to, these are guidelines for you to follow. So I would think, you know, as an ECMO center who's uh, participating in retrievals, you have a guideline with your local health authority or your infection control, stick to it. Um, most of these plans was, uh, at least in our country, it's essentially done under full PPE cover. So uh, I would think this will be again be decided by the availability of PPE, how much you run out of uh, PPE in this context. So all these things would matter. Um, that's that's where uh, a lot of uh, uh, activity is being, or, or let, there are a lot of hospitals that is investing in PAPR because these are stuff which need extra training. But once you know you use them, you can clean them up and reuse them again. Uh, so, uh, so again, you know, as I said, you know, these are difficult times to procure a PAPR at short notice. So you will you will essentially have to stick to a guideline which you formulate within your hospital and, and go about it. Thank you. I know we're creeping here on uh, the hour and so I'm gonna throw um, one last question out there because I know there's been a lot of uh, chatter in the WhatsApp group that I've seen um, and perhaps no one will wanna touch this one, but uh, any preference towards a certain antiviral on ECMO or is there no role? Let me take the first uh, <laughs> answer at that. First of all, there's not a clear answer to that question. Most of the infectious disease experts agree that it's more likely than not that an antiviral will be helpful if started early and uh, much, much less likely to be helpful if started once the patient's very sick in the ICU. There's several uh, candidates, remdesivir, chloroquine, and, um, and there's a couple others, um, and uh, we'll have to wait and see, but I think we will have data over the next few months based on several trials, but right now it's too early to say, but I, in our <clears throat> United States PEDAL NIH network, we are leaning toward the early treatment side for antivirals. Thank you, any other thoughts? Well, I agree with Michael. I think the other interesting thing people uh, have been asking on WhatsApp groups and which is a genuine question is, uh, you know, also adding anti-inflammatory drugs such as steroids, interleukin, antagonists, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think once again, once you're on ECMO and if you're needing all of these things with those risk factors pre-ECMO, uh, the chances once again of someone surviving all that small, but we don't know. The, I think the 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 reassuring thing is that the substantial amount of patients in Italy have received excellent intensive care under the circumstances and good quality data will come out of there. A lot of the countries which can afford that quality of intensive care can quite relate to that data and we can learn a lot from it and uh, we all look forward to it. Great. All right. Uh, I appreciate everyone, uh, all of our panelists tonight, giving their words of wisdom and sharing with all of us this evening. Um, thank you for all of the participants who were uh, hanging with us this evening. Uh, I know Velia has been working her magic behind the scenes. Um, so please spread the word that these, this presentation should be available on YouTube very soon. Um, if it's not already probably out there available as soon as we stop recording, as well as all the slides will be available. Um, I'm doing my best to capture all the questions that have come in that we just simply didn't have the time to completely answer um, with the goal that, uh, as I alluded to in the beginning, this is the first webinar. Um, we appreciate the overwhelming support in people who joined. And so I will try to make sure that as we approach uh, next week's webinar, and get dates and times out there to everyone that will try to also capture some of the questions that we didn't have time on the webinar to answer. So thank you everyone, stay safe, wash your hands, keep your hands off your face uh, and support one another. It was great uh, seeing everyone and, and spending the evening with you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, that was nice. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth, great job. <laughs>